Mr. Neff, why don't you drop by tomorrow evening around 8.30? He'll be in then. Who? My husband. You were anxious to talk to him, weren't you? Yeah, I was, but, uh, sort of getting over the idea now, if you know what I mean. There's a speed limit in this state, Mr. Neff. 45 miles an hour. How fast was I going, officer? I'd say around 90. Suppose you get down off your motorcycle and give me a ticket. Suppose I let you off with a warning this time. Suppose it doesn't take. Suppose I have to whack you over the knuckles. Suppose I bust out crying and put my head on your shoulder. Suppose you try putting it on my husband's shoulder. That tears it. <laughs> it's kind of hard to get their inflections down. They have a very specific... Uh... Very specific. And I also feel like particularly uh, particularly for Walter's character, you mm. have to have the face with mm. like the look, you know? Yeah, that huge like shit-eating grin that he has on his face mm -hmm. that whole time. Mm-hmm. Welcome to Your Pick, a film podcast. I'm Geneva. And I'm Tatum. We are two friends who love movies and love sharing them with each other. Each week, we take turns picking a film that is close to our hearts and talk about why it moves us, to tears, to laughter, and everything in between. We celebrate the craft of filmmaking, as well as the unique and personal ways we find meaning in the movies we watch. Tatum, what have you been watching this week? Um, I, I've actually, well, it's been a pretty mixed bag this past week. Um, Geneva, did I, I forget, did I talk about Saltburn, our last recording? Um, I think you did. I feel like you had just seen it at our last recording. Okay, gotcha. Um, if not, cool. I apologize. She hated it. <laughs> yeah, I hated Saltburn. That's all you need to know. <laughs> uh, it's, I hated it a lot. No, I'm pretty um, sure you did talk about it, though. <laughs> okay. Uh, but aside from Saltburn, I, yeah, so I rewatched The Fellowship of the Ring, which is a perfect film. Only The Fellowship of the Ring? Only The Fellowship, yes. I'm so impressed by your restraint. Only the fellowship. I yeah. I don't know. I feel like at this point in my life, I either have to watch them all in one day or watch them like a month apart for some reason. So um, yeah, I watched the first one with my friend, and she had never seen the extended version, which is always a delight for me to show people the extended version. And then they're like, "Oh wait, this version's better." And I'm like, "Yes, <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is." <laughs> <laughs> um. So that was quite fun to watch that with her and just kind of nerd out about the Lord of the Rings. She is very appreciative of my nerdiness. She doesn't just tolerate it. She appreciates Aww, it, which is nice. That's good. Um, so, yeah, I enjoyed watching or rewatching The Fellowship of the Ring. It just astounds me. Everything about it. Everything about it is just amazing. Um, I also watched the movie Asteroid City by Wes Anderson. Ooh. I... Yeah, I've been waiting to see it since last summer. I was unable to catch it in the theater. Um, I quite enjoyed it, actually. Wes Anderson is a director who, he's typically someone who I really love his stuff or his stuff is just not for me. He's never made anything that I haven't liked, but I just don't get it. Um, but this one, this one was interesting because it started out very sleepy. I was like, okay. It looks great, but I am falling asleep. <laughs> um, but I don't remember at what point this happens. Probably maybe like 30 to 40 minutes in. Uh, let me just say there's a little guy who shows up. <laughs> and after the little guy showed up, I was very invested. And I quite enjoyed the rest of the film. It's it's something where I almost feel like I want to watch it again because it, it brought up a lot of deep and profound themes and it was commenting on a lot of those things but the movie just kind of moved so quickly that you weren't really able to super hone in on them and think about them um so I feel like this is a movie that could be very very deep if you want it to be but it also could be a movie where you just come for the vibes and you just chill because the, like I said the colors are brilliant the cast is great I love the performances in this movie uh, Steve Carell should be in every single Wes Anderson project from now until eternity. Um, I'm just like, put Wes Anderson and Dev Patel in every single thing that he makes for the rest of time. Um, but yeah, it, it was, I really liked how it turned itself around in the latter part of the movie. And ultimately 
I liked it. I do think I will watch it again because like I said, I want to tap into a little bit more of the, the deep commentary. Um, and I really liked how the movie broke itself up into chapters. It would say like chapter one versus four and then chapter four and a half versus 5.1 or whatever. And then there was one point where it was like intermission optional. And then there was another part that was like chapters seven through 12, uh, no intermission permitted, or basically like you cannot pause the movie during this time. It was just very clever and very witty. Um, his movies are just so visually engaging. So anyway, it's not my favorite Wes Anderson, but I did, I did enjoy it. Um, and I would, I would probably watch it again. Um, so yeah, that's Asteroid City. Uh, so I officially only have two movies left to see for my, um, no, three. I have three movies left to see. Um, anyway, for my, like, tw- to finish out my 2023 movie ranking list. Um, and then the last movie that I watched, I actually watched yesterday, yesterday? No, day before yesterday. It, uh, it's called Shiva Baby. And sorry for a minute. I thought you said you watched the movie yesterday and I was like, that does oh. not seem like your taste. No, <laughs> you get I, to that? Okay. I did not watch that makes the movie more sense. yesterday. <laughs> Although I do want to see yesterday. I like the concept of it, even though I hear it was very bad execution. It's a great concept. The execution is fine. Okay. It is charming. It is not good, but it's okay. charming. Gotcha. Um, but yes, yeah, so I did not watch yesterday. I watched the movie Shiva Baby from 2020. And I, I, this movie had been on my list for a while just because, you know, it's kind of a, a small indie and I was like, okay, cool. Seems interesting. I, I'm very torn on this movie because on the one hand, I hated it mostly because I hate every single character in the movie. <laughs> um, the protagonist is a terrible person, very unlikable. Uh, the main male character without, well, I guess w- without spoiling things, he sucks too. Her parents are incredibly annoying. It's just, it's, it's, I, I don't know what it is about this movie because I don't necessarily mind watching things that have unlikable protagonists, but this protagonist was just unlikable in a way that I could not get past. Um, and she just felt very self-centered and like, oh, woe is me. My life sucks. I'm like, girl, you have everything handed to you and you're just like making poor decisions and doing like, why? I don't understand this chip you have on your shoulder. Clearly something happened to you and you're wanting to like rebel against this whole society thing, but I don't know what it was. Like what happened to you? Why are you like this? Um, so yeah, on the one hand, I was very frustrated with it and very angry at just the, the protagonist. <laughs> um, and it did feel very like I've seen things like this before. It doesn't really feel very original to me. Kind of just the claustrophobic type of feel of everyone's talking at once and da 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 da. But the the last, it's a very short movie. It's shorter than an hour and a half. Um, so the last like twenty to twenty five minutes. I was I was more engaged. Uh, that was when it kind of turned around for me a little bit. And I was like, okay, this movie's not terrible. Like, there's some things here to enjoy. Not enjoy, but to, that, that t- to engage with, basically. Um, so I'm pretty torn on it. I think I gave it a three-star rating on Letterboxd, which is fine for now. I might change it. Um, but at the same time, I really want to respect... Here's my honest, here's my honest feeling. I was watching this movie and I finished it and I was like, I'm complaining about all these things about this film. And then I had to step back and I was like, but this is the type of stuff that I feel like if I were a, you know, a filmmaker starting out, I would start at this level and like learn a lot and go from there. Yeah. I mean, as a a first feature film, which I think it is for Emma mm -hmm. Seligman, it's very impressive I think yeah so I didn't want to hate on her because I was like you know the ideas are there the execution wasn't bad like I she did like it's a it's a it's a good film and so I was pretty harsh on it but then when I stepped back and was like Tatum you're not Martin Scorsese (laughs) like you know and I was like you know what it's it's fine like I think think she accomplished a lot um yeah and 
it 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 shows that she has a lot of potential which obviously her next movie is bottoms and everyone is like yeah everyone I'm, loves that movie which I, I still haven't seen it yet but yeah i was gonna ask because um i i seen shiva baby i think it was actually a little more positive on it than you were i didn't love it but i thought it was had a lot of promise and it, whereas i did not really love bottoms um so I, if you if and when you do eventually watch bottoms i'd be very curious to hear your thoughts on it can i ask um have you seen anything with rachel senate in it um anything else with rachel senate in it did you see bodies 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 i did see bodies 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 okay. i liked her performance in that movie a lot okay yeah because she's I have not seen Bodies, 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 but in Bottom, similar to Shivit Baby, she plays a very like consciously unlikable character and is really kind of challenging you to find something redeeming. It did not work as well for me as in Bottoms as it did in Shiva Baby. So yeah, I'll be very curious to hear what your thoughts are when you when you finally watch Bottoms. Yeah, I I'm hoping to see Bottoms. This actually makes my list of movies remaining four, not three. But I would like to see it to finish out my ranking for 2023. Um, but it's I'm waiting to be able to rent it from the library, and there's like 500 gazillion holds on it, so I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> but I would like to see it. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I've been watching. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I'm excited for our next recording because by the time we record next, I will have seen both. All of us strangers and mm. the zone of interest. <gasps> Ooh. I have my tickets already purchased and I'm so excited. Um, okay. Yes. So in terms of what I've been watching, so quite a few things. Um, just very quickly, while I was home, I had kind of a built up multiple movies that I really liked and wanted to show my mom. So my mom and I watched Clue together. It was her first time seeing it clue from a that comedy from the me, 1980s that kind of, strikes me as a movie that you would have seen growing up i like know on repeat it was honestly shocking to me when i found out that she had never seen it before because it's full of comedians who are in other movies that she and i used to like i grew up watching with her um tim curry madeline Kahn, michael mckean etc cetera, etc cetera. but yeah it's oh i love clue so much it's so delightful it's so funny and it's so sad to me that it was a big flop when it came out but i think it's been reclaimed as it should it's be. a cult classic it people is, love that yeah. movie um let's see i showed her a movie that i love honestly might consider doing on the podcast someday but it's called it's a period drama called their finest it's not like you know brilliant groundbreaking oscar worthy work or anything like that but it's about film propagandaists uh during the the british blitz <clears throat> you know who are working under these extreme conditions where their their houses are being bombed every day and they're trying to create these films to inspire the british population to continue the fight against the nazis and to survive and to go on and it's just honestly it's one of the best films that I have seen for depicting the creative process in a way that's very specific because you see, you go through the germ of this idea that they have at the very beginning about this true story that they want to base this film on. They find out the true story is not actually so true, but they invent some details, they create something, and then as the film goes on, the the writers, they debate with each other. Uh, things come up, actors have to be put in or drop out, and they need to change the story. And then by the end, they've created this this film that, I mean, you know, we're meant to believe is not necessarily great, but is exactly what the people need at that moment. And it is this really beautiful story about the power of art to bring people together and to give us courage and hope in really, you know, dark distressing times so i really love that movie if you want like a sort of bittersweet british period drama to make you cry a little bit but also make you hopeful <laughs> i really recommend it it has it stars Gemma arterton who's a, a british actress that i i think is very talented in addition to being absolutely gorgeous um sam claflin who i've always liked bill nye just a bunch of you know great british actors so yeah they're finest I also showed my mom this <laughs> this really tiny, charming indie movie called Pinball, The Man Who Saved the Game, starring Mike Feist from uh, West Side Story, which is loosely based on the true story about the man who helped to get pinball unbanned in New York City. But what? <laughs> it's really this 
very charming what? movie about this 25 year old man who moves to the city hoping to become a writer and basically the only thing he's good at is playing pinball and he discovers that it's banned and so he's working to try and like share his obsession with the world but also he's he meets this single mom who has a son and starts dating her and is trying to figure out basically just coming into maturity and figuring out like you know i need to make choices i need to figure out how what i want to commit my life to um and yeah it's like <laughs> it's kind of a comedy it's kind of a romantic comedy it's very light it doesn't take itself too seriously at all but it's i mean just, it's a movie about it's <laughs> it is <laughs> you learn a lot more about pinball in that movie that i would never have thought possible <laughs> What would a serious tear jerking drama about pinball look like? <laughs> Cannot imagine that. Um, Mike Feist wears this ginormous, extremely fake looking mustache throughout the entire thing, which is hilarious. And the other co characters are constantly commenting on it. Um, it is just such a such a cute movie. Like it's you can't be sad and watch this movie. I, I really enjoyed it. It's not great, but it's a lot of fun. Next, I did see the new rom-com rom Anyone But You in theaters. Of course you did. Uh, of course I did. <laughs> Starring um, Glenn Powell and Sydney Sweeney. I gave it two and a half stars. And I feel How like that's... How many of those stars are just because Glenn Powell was in it? Uh, two? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like I might be a little bit too harsh on it because it is... There's some really charming bits. But it's one of those things where I feel like the potential is there but the script lets it down quite a bit it's got two very charming charismatic leads and i don't think they're super well cast together but they do have decent chemistry but the script is just not there for them there are a couple decent lines and set pieces but overall it's just pretty weak and i've been trying to figure out a letterboxed review for it but i have this theory that the the best rom-coms are ones that really go for specificity and really allow us to relate to the characters. I don't think this is a particularly groundbreaking thing to say, but so many modern rom-coms, their theory of how to create escapism is take the most beautiful people on the planet, make them look the most beautiful that they possibly can, and then send them to the most beautiful locations in the world. And it's like, no, 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 the escapism from a rom-com comes from the idea of a person this like you or me you. exactly a person that yeah. we can relate to finding the idea of true love which is not something that you know exists I, <laughs> i'm not i don't believe in soulmates but like when you watch a rom-com you think well maybe this could happen you know that's where the the joy and the escapism comes from it's not from the everything looks like a tourism commercial you know and so this is one of those movies that just relies a little bit too much on the gloss and the sheen rather than actually creating really interesting quirky characters that we can relate to and a lot of this is the the secondary characters i think they have a lot of good actors there but they're just given nothing to do which is unfortunate they're all just kind of generically nice and you don't want that in a rom-com you want people you remember you want like silly situations or quirky people um you it know, sounds thinking, like I would hate this movie. <laughs> I don't think you would like this movie. <laughs> it is also, um, <clears throat> which is something I do like about it, but it, they don't do nearly enough with it. It is sort of a riff on Much Ado About Nothing. Um, I do love a modern day riff on a Shakespeare tale, but they just, they kind of set it up and it doesn't really go anywhere, which is disappointing. So... Yeah, I would definitely recommend seeing it if you like rom-coms, if you want to support rom-coms in the theater, because we don't get enough of them theatrically theatrically released anymore. Um, but I, I also want the industry to do better, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Go see All of Us Strangers instead. Yeah. It's a romantic <laughs> A nice, <movie>. charming <laughs> rom-com. Yeah. <laughs> All of light. Us Strangers. <laughs> Super light. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. It and really makes you think, I want that to happen to me. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the last thing that I have been watching recently, I've been in the midst of a rewatch of all the Hunger Games movies. So I've watched the first two. Hot take. This franchise is amazing. I unironically mm. adore that the is Hunger a hot Games take. franchise. I... Yeah, I I love the Hunger Games franchise. I think it's underrated. Have I think you people read are the books? coming to Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got I've it. seen the movies more than I've read the books. Um okay. but I have read the books. Um but yeah, just I every time I rewatch the movies, I'm 
I kind of gain more respect, honestly, for what they're doing and the themes that they're tackling and the level of complexity within something that is ostensibly for children and teenagers. Like these are dark, heavy movies that are about really real world themes about trauma and war and, you know, protecting the ones you love versus um, living the revolutionary life and dying for a greater cause. And, you know, there are real world you know, things that these movies are tackling and they're doing it in a way that's accessible. Um, and I think they're doing it very well. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the defenders of the, the two Mockingjay movies. I know those movies are not quite as well liked as say Catching Fire, but I, I think Catching Fire is the best, but I think they're also very, the Mockingjay movies are also very good. And yeah, I don't know. I'm really glad that I feel like more people are going back and rewatching them because of Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes has become been such a hit and I think that's right I think it's a really good franchise yeah I think I think Catching Fire is an incredible movie I I love that film a lot um I do not like the Mockingjay movies because I don't like the movies but also because I don't like that book um I love the Hunger Games and Catching Fire books a lot I think the Hunger Games adaptation of the first book is fine um, I was, Catching Fire is phenomenal. Catching and then Fire Mockingjay. is absolutely phenomenal. I will say I kind of, I always remember the Hunger Games, the first Hunger Games movie is like, oh, that's the one that kind of sets everything up and then Catching Fire really takes it to the next level, which is true. But I also forget how good the first Hunger Games movie is. I had forgotten how, like... Because I feel like there were criticisms at the time. It really makes use of shaky cam, which was a trend in Hollywood at that time that was kind of on its last legs. Um, but it really does a great job of giving you that documentary feel, getting you into the the time and place of these characters, this really exhausted, dirty world, and then creating that contrast with the the glitz and glam of the ridiculous capital. And yeah, ah, the Hunger Games movies, they're so good, as are the books. Maybe we should do an episode on Catching Fire so we can talk about these movies more because... I would love to. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like th this is not the time or the place to have an in-depth conversation <laughs> about the Catching Fire. There's so much you could talk about. Yeah. We don't have yeah. the time or place, but... I yeah. was not aware you were such a big fan, though. That's that's a fun, fun fact Yeah. Well, you. it's the sort of thing that, like, it's it sort of lies dormant because people have not really been talking about Hunger Games, but every once in a while I'll get a hankering to rewatch all the movies, and now finally with... Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, I have an excuse to rewatch them all, and it's been a good time. And by good time, I mean extremely brutal and depressing time. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah. All we right. should talk about this sometime. We off should. Air, all right. Because I do have yeah. thoughts about these movies Ooh. and books, but as I said, this is not the time for, <laughs> not the time for me for to place. do that. So. <laughs> all right, TBD. Okay, why don't we get into our discussion of the movie we're talking about today? All Let's right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Today on the show, we are discussing Double Indemnity, the 1944 film noir directed by Billy Wilder, starring Barbara Stanwyck, Fred McMurray, and Edward G. Robinson. The script was co-written by Billy Wilder and Raymond Chandler, based on the novel by James M. Kane, who, fun fact, also wrote the source material for Mildred Pierce. See our earlier I, episode on yep. Mildred Pierce. I totally see that. Yep. <laughs> yep. Th there's, there's a thread there for mm -hmm. sure. Yep. And then if you ever see the movie, The Postman Always Rings Twice, he also wrote the original novel for that and very clear threads uh, running throughout all three of those. All right. Kane's original novel, uh, which was actually based on an, a case in the late 1920s of a woman who conspired with her lover to murder her husband and gain an accident insurance payout, was first published serially in 1936. Production companies were immediately interested in a film adaptation, but getting a version of the script that would be approved by the production code office proved to be a years-long battle. The production code, as we all know, was not a big fan of things like adultery and murder and glamorization of criminals and things like that. So eventually, Billy Wilder came on board with the project and started working on a treatment that was deemed acceptable. Wilder's usual writing partner chose not to work on the film, so Wilder decided to bring on board Raymond Chandler, who is a famous detective fiction author. Um, he's the, the guy who invented the character of Philip Marlowe. Uh, his novels have separately been adapted into multiple classic film noir films. Uh, Wilder's idea was that 
Chandler had the very natural sort of writing voice for dialogue that would work well with Kane's story, uh, which is true. Wilder and Chandler, however, were both very strong personalities, and apparently they had a very difficult time working together. <laughs> uh, Raymond Chandler was a um, apparently a massive alcoholic who had sort of been in remission when they started and was back to being an alcoholic by the end. Um, and Wilder later uh, based, like, he later made a movie called The Lost Weekend about a an alcoholic, and apparently he partially based it on Raymond Chandler. But all that being said, Wilder does say that their struggle, the kind of push-pull that they went through, was very instrumental in creating the film and making it kind of as sharp and as, as good as it was. Um, casting this, for this film was also pretty tricky, and I found this kind of fascinating. I don't know if anyone else will, but this film, in a way, marked a turning point in the careers of all three of its leads. So Fred McMurray, this is basically his first time playing an unsavory he unsavory character. He'd just basically been doing comedies leading up to this. Initially, he tried to turn down the role, thinking that he just didn't have it in him to do it. But Wilder insisted that he play it. And Fred McMurray eventually agreed. And he gave a, I think, really great performance. And being Walter Neff eventually ended opened up this whole new dimension to his career. Obviously, he later went on to work with Billy Wilder again in the apartment where he played a sleazy philandering executive. Um, Kind of not too dissimilar from his Walter Neff role. Barbara Stanwyck, who I adore, was an extremely popular actress at the time. Her persona was generally very kind of brassy, independent heroines, but she was nervous about playing a role as villainous as Philip Dietrichson, and she was worried that it could hurt her career. There is this really great quote from Barbara Stanwyck that's listed on Wikipedia, so I'm just going to read it. She said, um, she like talking to Billy Wilder, she said, I love the script and I love you, but I'm a little afraid that after all these years of playing heroines to go into an out and out killer. And Mr. Wilder, and rightly so, looked at me and he said, well, are you a mouse or are you an actress? And I said, well, I hope I'm an actress. And he said, then do the part. And I did. And I'm very grateful to him. Um, and then lastly, Edward G. Robinson was reluctant to accept the role of Barton Keyes because he had been a leading actor for the last like 10, 15 years of his career. And choosing to accept a role in a movie where he would be third build basically meant that, that those days would be over. He would be shifting permanently into kind of supporting and character roles. Yeah. Um, there on my the DVD for Double Indemnity, there was an introduction by Robert Osborne, you know, the kind of Turner Classic Movies introduction, and he talked about this story. And the way Robert Osborne um, said it was basically Edward G. Robinson made the decision, well, you know, at some point I'm going to need to make this shift anyway. It's better to just take a supporting role in a really excellent movie than just keep doing leading roles for longer, but do them in mediocre movies. And I think he made the right decision. Can I just say that uh, my DVD had the same intro and I skipped over it because it was very long and I didn't want to watch it. But the first thing I thought of was, good evening, everyone. My name is Reese De what? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I love what, this. What are these much. questions? I do not know. <laughs> this is not why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Just ask my wife. <laughs> that was the first thing I thought oh of. Oh my gosh. My name is Reese De what? <laughs> the first thing I thought of is SNL also did a skit with Jason Sudeikis playing Robert Osborne, and he did a pitch perfect imitation of him mm -hmm. to the extent that, like, I don't. I didn't remember Robert Osborne's voice, but as soon as he started talking, I was like, oh, that's Robert Osborne. <laughs> yep. Anyway. All right. So um, just to finish out my intro, as we will talk about, Double Indemnity is the product of many skilled filmmakers, actors, and craftsmen working at the top of their game. It is an absolute classic of film noir and was highly influential in the development of the genre. And I found this really great quote by film critic Angelica, Angelica Jade Bastian in her essay on Criterion. So I'm just going to use that to sum it all up. <clears throat> she writes, The film is near perfect, and it's a testament to the art of collaboration. Perceptive editing by Dewan Harrison, Miklos Rosa's swelling score, the piercingly rhythmic, hard-edged dialogue by novelist Raymond Chandler, who co-wrote the screenplay, the perfectly cast actors playing off one another in ways that both reveal their artistry and the power of noir archetypes, 
the precision of Edith Head's costuming. John F. Seitz's his cinematography that plunges the leads deeper and deeper into a darkness from which they can't escape, all work together to create an endlessly entertaining picture, and one that would shape the genre, not just in terms of the style and story, but with its sharp vision of the seen and unseen forces of American life. All right, so that is Double Indemnity. So um, I was trying to think of like, when is the first time that I've seen this movie? I've seen this movie so many times. I was probably a teenager, maybe in high school, maybe a little bit younger the first time I saw it. I don't have a super strong memory associated with it, but I was kind of immediately hooked and have watched it many times since. Um, in particular, I love... I love Barbara Stanwyck in general. I'm obsessed with her. She's like my favorite classic Hollywood actress. I think she's brilliant. And she's, it's so strange to realize that this movie was kind of a departure for her because your, she. Your outfit in yeah. the, the cover for our Your Pick podcast is like her outfits as a person. It's true. So, <laughs> like, if you go to IMDb and you look at Barbara Stanwyck, that is literally what you are wearing. I probably used that <laughs> a photo of her as a reference when we were getting the artwork created. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, I just, I think she's wonderful. And yeah, this movie is just, it's, there's something so mesmerizing about, you know, it's so sordid and oppressive but so fascinating at the same time these are truly unlikable truly sleazy characters but there is something that's really compelling about them and rewatching the movie just now i i connected so strongly i mean i i always have but even more strongly than in the past by the relationship between walter neff and barton keys and that sort of almost brotherly relation, older brother, younger brother relationship that the two of them have and the way that they um, I have what I think is a really genuine love and affection for each other and the sense of betrayal, but also, you know, continuing that affection at the end, which I think is just so beautiful and so compelling. So anyway, I'm excited to talk about this <laughs> movie. Tatum, what is your relationship to Double Indemnity? So I saw this movie for the first time, I don't know, a few years ago. It was another one of those movies on my list of these are all the movies I have to see, blah, blah, blah. And so I probably watched it. It was like 2019-ish, I would say. Um, and I remember it was a movie where, so I was visiting a friend down in St. Louis at the time. And I don't remember where he was or if he was sleeping or what. I don't know. But I was watching this movie and he somehow showed up like, I don't know, a half hour in or something like that or 45 minutes in. And he sat down and he was like, Tatum, what is this movie? And we finished the movie and he was like, oh my gosh, I need to go back and watch this from the beginning. So he entered in not even at the beginning and he was like, whoa, and like stuck with it till the end. Um... So yeah, I, yeah, so that was the first time I watched this movie. I really enjoyed it. I remember finishing it and just being very blown away. I was excited to watch it again. This was my second time watching the movie. Um, I will say I was not, I'm not going to say I wasn't as blown away by it this time around because I think there's something very special about watching it the first time when you don't really know where it's going and what's going to happen. And that magic is a little bit lost when you watch it again. Um, so I didn't necessarily have that, that idea of like, oh man, they, they're not going to get away with this and how's it going to happen? Cause I knew how it ended. But that being said, because I knew it was going to happen, I was able to pay attention to other parts of the movie that I didn't necessarily play, play, pay as much close attention to last time. I was very struck by the writing this time around. Um, the writing in this film is incredible the dialogue that it's just so good and um I also was very struck particularly by um Fred Mac McMurray's performance I think his performance is very very good I would like to talk about it more because I have very specific thoughts on his portrayal of this character um and then I really really connected with not connected with but I really enjoyed the character of Barton Keyes this time around he's my favorite character in this movie I think he he's the heart and soul of this film. If he was not in it, this movie would not work. Um, 
I mean, literally, because he's the one who figures out that it's fishy and that, you know, and he solves the crime, which I'm like, dude, how do you have this much jurisdiction? Like, I don't understand. You're not a police <laughs> officer, but whatever. Um, where Imagine another, like, of version of the from? universe where Barton Keyes had gone into becoming, like, a detective or something like I that. I know, right? It's like, how is he tapping phones? Like, who gave... I don't know. Um, but anyway, so, yeah, I... I won't say I liked it a little bit less this time. I'll just say I experienced it in a different way. Um, it, but overall, I do still really enjoy this movie. Um, I am not a particular fan of the score in this film. It does feel very oppressive to me at times of just like, oh my, you are so loud and you are really, really wanting me to feel something right now. It just was very over the top for me at certain points that it was quite frankly a little bit annoying. Um, but that's honestly like my only complaint with this movie. I think everything else about it is very well done. Um, and seeing this movie and knowing that knowing the influence that it has on cinema going forward is um, just another cool, I don't know, study while watching the film. But yeah, I'm really glad I watched it again. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal film and I would just like to put this out there. I mentioned this during the apartment episode, but I want to remind people, this is proof that I am a Billy Wilder fan. I love his movies. It's just the apartment does not work for me for reasons that apparently aren't relevant to anyone else on the planet Earth, and that's fine. Um, but I would like to try and redeem myself a little bit by talking about this movie. I think this movie's brilliant. I, I like it a lot. So just, <laughs> just putting that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this actually, this, I mean, this is the third Billy Wilder film, I think, that we've done on the podcast now because we also did Some Like It Hot. Um, I mean, oh, that's right. Yeah, we did. Yeah. I mean, just, oh, man. I, sometimes you're just like, how is there much, that much talent in one person? It's unfair. Like, when you think about the fact that Billy Wilder has five to ten movies that are just absolute stone cold classics of their genre but it's multiple wildly different genres you know film noir um light comedy um detective thriller like cynical sort of news um uh, satire like he just his his range it's incredible <laughs> it's really incredible it, it makes me think of um and I don't know if they're often compared, I'm not sure, but it makes me think of Stanley Kubrick, who he has, I mean, less than 10 films in his filmography, but they're all, not all of them, well, whatever. His movies are masterpieces, and but they're all different genres, and it's just like, how... How do you do this? Yeah. Like, I don't understand. Yeah. I do, I mean, I, I love a director who, you know, they know their lane. They're extremely good at it. A lot of their movies are kind of tackling similar themes. I think that's amazing. But there really is some a special place in my heart for directors who try kind of stretch themselves with different with each movie that they make and and can really master very different sort of tones and and genres. There, are, yeah, there aren't enough of them um, who can. I mean, there are very basically no one else who's doing it at this level specifically but um yeah. i always love to see it try similar to actors i mean actors who can like do a intense drama one moment and a stupid comedy the next like it always it always delights me yeah yeah uh do you want to start with the the characters i was thinking maybe we can talk about the movie generally and then um dive into a bit of the plot unless we end up just talking about the movie generally and <laughs> for yeah. a long time but um yeah yeah let's just start maybe talk through some of the characters. You mentioned you had some thoughts about Walter Neff as a character. Do you want to start with that? Yeah, it's not necessarily... Well, I was going to say it's more about Fred McMurray's performance more than Walter Neff, but I think they're kind of so intertwined in terms of my thoughts. So, yeah, it was interesting because I was watching this movie and, you know, the, the quote that we read at the beginning, that whole scene where they meet for the first time and he's walking around their house and they're having this conversation, this like banter back and forth. And I was watching this and I was like, I should hate this guy. He is everything about t the types of men that Tatum hates, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like he's very forceful. He's very sleazy. He's very, um, 
kind of gross and objectifying and like he's just not he's everything that Tatum does not like in men but it works for me because Fred McMurray's performance just somehow is so like I was watching him and I was like I hate men like this also I'm not straight but I like I would want to go like I would want to go on <laughs> There's a something date with so you compelling about that. him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the his face, his his body movements, his eyes. I'm just like his ability to be this really kind of creepy guy. I mean, he's a not to you can cut this out, but like salesmen are kind of Blah, not like my yeah well certainly people. there's like that archetype of like the slimy sort of fast talking salesman who tries to just manipulate you to his you know to whatever he wants like that's that's kind of a yeah. character archetype yeah so i just i don't know i was just very intrigued by my reaction to him and the fact that i was like oh dang you're hot, you know, and kind of how you were saying before we started recording, this movie convinced you for a long time that Fred McMurray is an attractive man, which some people might think he is, and that's fine. Yeah, but I mean, what, he, he's not like standard Hollywood attractive in any way, but in this movie, there's something about him. He is so attractive, yeah. even as he is so such a slime ball. Yeah, I, so I don't know. I just wanted to mention that. I don't know what it is about his perf- Well, I mean, I do. It's like his eyes, his 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 body movements. And I also think the the script lends itself to him giving this sort of performance because it shapes the character in a way that somehow makes him endearing. And you can't really explain why there's just a factor th- that you don't, it's like, there's just some sort of wow factor that you can't really put your finger on. So I don't know. I just thought it was this really nice combination of like, performance and character and writing and also probably directing too in terms of blocking and and figuring out things like that um so yeah i i just i thought that that was very interesting that i had this very strong response to this character who in other circumstances i would hate <laughs> <laughs> yeah so when well, i think yeah. it helps too that he's you know, he's put opposite these two incredible powerhouse performers in Edward G. Robinson and Barbara Stanwyck, who match his energy so well and make him more compelling. Like, you know, Fred McMurray is bringing so much, but they're also matching him so perfectly. And so, you know, when he's, (laughs) it's so funny, he comes into the Dietrichson household and he just does not miss a beat. He's immediately Mm -mm. coming onto her at every moment. Yep. But she, like with her performance and the the looks on her face and the way that she responds and the sort of coy, like, I'm not really going to directly answer that, but you can tell that I'm, you know, responding. Like, it doesn't seem like he's just do picking on someone or, or you know, it's not predatory. It mm-hmm. would be predatory if it was someone else, but it's not predatory right. for her because she is so into it immediately, you know? She meets him tit for tat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And I just again this his performance is so compelling because Walter Neff really is this mass of contradictions you know he is he is so smart in certain ways like he he does a very good job of thinking out this elaborate plan and coming up with every contingency but he's such a chump when it comes to Phyllis you know she just walks right all over him and he doesn't see it until the last moment and he is like i said you know he's immediately walking into a room feeling like he owns it he has this sort of cynical detachment from everything like he's just kind of waltzing through life and doing whatever pleases him whatever amuses him he sees a beautiful woman and he's just immediately like all right i'm just gonna flirt with her and and see if she'll go for it but then at the same time he has this relationship with keys where there is something i think really sweet and endearing about the relationship and keys is such a genuine person like you know, we love him and the fact that he loves Neff allows us to see something in Neff that we're not necessarily seeing elsewhere. And so it is this character that is just somehow Fred McMurray and is made, able to make you believe that these are all f- different facets of the same person. You know, this this skeezy philanderer who immediately, well, not immediately, but pretty quickly jumps to let me murder this person who I don't know just because he has something that I want with this person who's able to have this really genuine friendship with 
someone who does not seem to benefit him in any way. He just really enjoys Keyes' company. And yeah, I think that's really compelling to be able to put all of those things together and make us believe it. Yeah, I really I really like that scene in the movie when um when things are starting to crumble and Walter goes to the office and he listens to kind of the the report that Keyes made regarding, you know, the whole situation and and it really seems like Walter is going in there with this, you know, cautious fear that maybe Keyes has said something that like he suspects Walter but you also have this sense that at least for me he seems nervous that Keyes maybe hasn't but he also seems to be confident that he didn't say anything but he just wants to confirm that that's I don't know it feels like there's this battle inside of himself of like I don't think he would have said anything but what if he did and and like the, it feels like there's emotional stakes there because when he's listening to the recording and Keyes says I would not I do not I have zero suspicions about this man because of you know the logistics of blah 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 but also because of the history that we have I personally vouch for him and you see this reaction from Walter of just like that there is this look of affection on his face not just relief but genuine affection you know knowing that this person really cares for him and trusts him in a way that he does not deserve. <laughs> yeah. But um like he doesn't I just want love that d- yeah. dynamic between the two of them. Yeah. Like he doesn't want Keys to find out what he did, you know, obviously because he doesn't want to go to the electric chair, but also because he doesn't want Keys to be disappointed in him. Um and what I love about that ending too is the way the way that Keyes react reacts to finding out what Walter did and the way that he's just so kind of quiet about it and gentle about it and so like, all right, you've been caught, but I'm not immediately turning my back on you. I'm going to stay with you through this to the end. You know, it, we end the movie with Keyes basically most likely about to bleed out on the floor within the next two minutes. But Keyes is right there. Even and then though there's no blood at all. Yeah. <laughs> they had mentioned like their janitor saw a little bit of blood. It's like if he wasn't walking the way that he was walking, mm-hmm. I would have no idea that he was bleeding. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, there's like a there's a pen leaked ink yeah. in his shirt. <laughs> there's a dark stain on his shoulder that gets a little bit bigger throughout the film, and that's about it. It's um, a leaky pen. Yeah, but just the that oh, that line at the end where Walter is like, the reason you couldn't figure it out is because the person that you were looking for was so close. He was just across the desk, and Keyes says, even closer than that. Like, I just, it moved me so much this time around. I don't know why, yeah. but I was just, yeah, I was just so struck by that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it moved me this time as well, you know, and, and that, I don't know. I just really liked that scene too when Keys comes to Walter's apartment. And he's like, "No, no, no. There's there's something off here, you know." And you see him really really fighting the possibility that it could be Walter. Like he's he's saying everything and just really being like, "No, no, no. But it's every other possibility except you. It couldn't be you." And Walter keeps asking these prompting questions that he could have responded and been like, "Oh, maybe what but he's just like no 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 and so I just thought that that I don't know showed further just a little bit more a the fact that Keyes even goes there to talk to him about this it shows that there's trust there but also just seeing how much he's fighting the real possibility that it could be Walter even if it wasn't Walter there is a possibility that it could be you know but he just will not will not even consider that as an option yeah Yeah. I was so struck by, um, and I mean, maybe it's a little on the nose, but I, for some reason, had never picked up on it before. You know, so much of this movie is about this theme of kind of the corruption underlying, you know, typical American suburban life in the 1930s, uh, that sort of thing. Well, made in the 1940s, set in the 1930s. Um, But at the beginning, Keyes and Walter, they're kind of, you know, hanging out, kind of complaining about their job. And Keyes is complaining, like, we keep writing these insurance policies for people who are obviously dishonest and then they put in these phony claims and then I have to investigate them. And, you know, this person has done this phony claim. Walter's like, it's not my fault because I 
pointed out when I spoke with him, like I attached a note to his file saying he needs to be investigated and the company just did not bother to do it because they just wanted to get the sale down. And um, and of course, there's this dramatic irony, which I only just picked up <laughs> this time around watching of like, yeah, the company is not caring about who they're selling policies to because of their bottom line. Apparently, they're also not caring about who's who selling the them? policies. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But yeah, just this idea of like, you know, an un unwillingness to sort of investigate what could be under the surface because of the financial benefit. And then that leads to all of these problems down the line. And I mean, it's a pretty sort of basic theme, but I was just so struck by it. I'm like, Keys, <laughs> you're complaining about the company, but you don't see the corruption that's right in front of you. But because of this personal relationship that they have, you know, he doesn't want to see it. And yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm just so fascinated by this character of Walter Neff and like how he stayed in this job for, I think he says like 11 years. Um, You know, at, at a certain point, he turns down a the possibility of a promotion well sort of a promotion like an opportunity kind of to promotion. kind of yeah an opportunity to move into a different sector where he would work more closely with keys and just the personality differences between them you know they have such affection for each other but keys is you know he's all about ferreting out truth and um maintaining the integrity of what they are doing um i mean you know protecting the company not paying out phony claims but he's able to find this enormous sense of fulfillment just by sitting at a desk and looking through all these sheaves of papers, which he, he says, like, you know, this contains all the drama that you could ever want in the world. Whereas Neff is just all about being footloose and fancy free, you know, going out into the world, making sales and kind of just seeing what comes along. He doesn't really want to be tied down by anyone or anything. Um, you made me think of that that one scene when Key's kind of goes through the the not the logistics but like the list of everything that he's learned of just like you haven't read these books and you haven't read these cases and you didn't know that the percentage of people that that die this way and this way yes. and this way and <laughs> actuarial tables suicide by train by car by gun by rope by you know just like listing yeah, like, off every single you know the likelihood statistic. of this happening zero <laughs> He knows it. He lives it. You know, that's like his yeah. reading these statistics is entire. Oh, man, that scene with the boss is so good. Just the boss I... who's like so clearly like, you know, he was the son of the person who founded the company and now thinks he's a big man because he grew up in the business, but he has never actually had to like spend Get any real time. Dirty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think of that guy's performance? Because I was like, dude, you are sticking out like a sore thumb in this movie because <laughs> you are not up to the caliber of anyone else in this cast. Yeah, I mean, his, like, because his character is supposed to be someone who's just, you know, puffing himself up and clearly has no idea what he's doing, it worked for me because I'm just like, well, clearly he's lost, like, and he's trying to pretend that he's not, but he is. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I can definitely see that. Speaking also, too, of, of just kind of moments in the movie, one specifically between Walter and Keyes that I loved, I, I wrote the quote down in my in my notebook, I think it's the first time we see the two of them interacting after the guy who like burned his truck. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and he leaves, he's like, "Well, no, I don't have a truck." And they're like, "Well, I don't you know." Should have thought of that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and so he leaves, and then Keys and Walter kind of have this moment, and Keys is complaining about the system, and then Walter's just like, "All right, flip the record over. Let's hear it." And I'm like, <laughs> "I need to start using that in my that life." Is, I didn't I even love catch that. That's line. a great line. Yeah, it's I love it great so much. Little shorthand. There's so many in this movie that I, I mean, I wrote some of them down, but there's just so many that come and go that I couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't get all of them. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. of the big ones, like, I don't, I feel like it, it sounds cheesy when you just say it out, but in context with the music and with Fred McMurray's delivery, it's so good. The part where he's driving home and he's like, the air smelt of honeysuckles. I didn't mm -hmm. realize that murder could smell like honeysuckles. It's just, mm -hmm. it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. And then another line that I wrote down was, I mean, because this was kind of an ongoing thing in the interaction between Keys and, and the, the boss, Mr. Norton, but Norton kind of commented on his lack of suit. 
And oh yeah. <laughs> and towards the end, when Keys walks out, he's like, "Next time, I'll rent a tuxedo." <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> so good. I really love Keys. Yeah. I would. You know, if Keys was an actual person, I would. I would want to be friends with him 100%. Mm-hmm. I would be like, I don't know if you want to be friends with me, but I'm going to try real hard because I want you in my life. Yeah, he's so compelling on his own. Like, you can see why, even though he's so different from Neff, why Neff loves hanging out with him, you know? He's funny. He's hardworking. He's passionate. He's kind. He's mm-hmm. caring. I'm like, what's not to like about yeah. this guy? Please be my friend. <laughs> he cares about the work. He doesn't care. You know, he has no time for putting on suit jackets to go see the boss. Like, he's all about doing his job. So I have a question for you. We've talked quite a bit about Keys and Neff slash like their performances. Can you talk a little bit about Phyllis and Barbara Stanwyck? Because you seem to have a much stronger reaction to her performance than I do. Um, I don't think her performance is bad, but I feel like she is kind of outshadowed by other performances in this. But I suspect that you disagree. So I want to hear your your thoughts on this character and, and her performance. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, she is doing this or, sort of... Sorry, not outshadowed, overshadowed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's doing this sort of femme fatale, film noir femme fatale archetype, which, you know, has been done many times. And so it, it can be a little bit difficult sometimes to sort of create something that really stands out. And part of it is like, I've seen so many different things with Barbara Stanwyck in it, and she plays very different characters in them. And so, like, you know, understanding the totality of her as an actress like makes me like the performance even more but I think she just I was really compelled by her especially on this watching as this woman who feels like she has this objectively pretty comfortable and privileged life but she is so unhappy with everything that she has And she also is not in a place where she can really go out and change the circumstances that she's in. She's, she has made these choices and grasped for a life that she thinks is going to make her happy. Like she potentially murdered someone in order to get them out of the way so that she could marry. Like she, it seems, murdered the, um, Mr. Dietrichson's original wife, first wife, so that she could marry him. And now she's living this relatively comfortable life in a beautiful house in California, but she hates it. She feels stuck and suffocated. The marriage is horrible. Mr. Dietrichson hates her. Lola hates her because she hates them (laughs) back. And um, there's this moment where she's at Walter's apartment, and I can't remember the exact line, but it's just the this something where she talks about how wonderful it is that you can live on your own in the city with strangers around you and pe- there's no one sitting and hating you across the breakfast table. And just this idea that, you know, as a man, Walter Neff has this ability to just sort of float through life and, you know, choose whether or not he wants to become attached to someone. And if he doesn't like his job, he can just pick up and move somewhere else and remake himself. And she doesn't have that luxury in the same way. And she just has this overpowering um, desire and lust for something different in her life. And it's kind of twisted her into, I mean, you know, she's probably bad to begin with and it's just twisted her further. But I find there's something so compelling about that, you know, these really relatable um, needs and dissatisfactions that are at the core of all the choices that she makes. Obviously, she makes these horrendous, <laughs> villainous decisions, but I think at her core, there's something really relatable about this feeling that I, I'm i in this place in life where I feel stuck and trapped, and I don't like it, and I don't know how to get out, and so I'm just grasping at anything that will will get me to a different place. That is so interesting. That is not how I see her at all. Oh, interesting. How do you I, how do you sir see her? I see her as a psychopath. Like the thing that you're saying about you don't know what it's like to sit at a table and the people across from you hate you or whatever. And I didn't see that as a social commentary. I just saw it as her family hates her because she hates them and she's, you know, it's just not a good dynamic. And so I didn't see that as anywhere she goes or anyone that she's with that's kind of just what happens and she's trapped in this system because she's a woman I just was like no 
the people in your household don't like you and that's why this is happening and and as the movie goes on you start to discover well they probably dislike you because you've put them in a position that makes them (laughs) not like you and so for me as the movie unravels especially by the time we get to the end when when Walter confronts her and is basically saying out loud like okay so you you did away with this woman that you were a nurse for and then you did away with the father and then are you going to do away with Nino and then who's next me and da 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 and so it just made me sense that this woman just has this cycle of she doesn't really have a reason why she's doing this it's just because she wants more more of whatever it doesn't matter she just wants more and she just seemed to be a very calculating manipulative person who is killing people for reasons that don't really exist but she doesn't really feel any sort of remorse after doing this and doesn't really feel anything about the people or towards the people she just feels like someone who doesn't really feel much and she's just acting out of just a tendency that she has to kill people I guess and doesn't really care about the stakes because she doesn't feel anything so I don't know I really have honestly no empathy for her character at all Um, well the thing is actually I don't really disagree with you I think I think it works I think it works really really well in the context of the story and and you know it it's that's part of the reveal of the story you know you learn more and more about how she really is a heartless (laughs) person um so yeah it, it's not a it's not a critique of the story itself but for me she just seems like someone who I have zero empathy for I'm just like no I I have no pity for you you're doing these things and you don't have to you could just stop like I don't <laughs> yeah, yeah well well the, the the thing is I don't really disagree with you on any of that I do think she's basically a psychopath and there really isn't any room for us to have empathy for her. I just find that so compelling because I think she speaks to aspects of ourselves that are dark and grasping and, you know, just endlessly, you know, unable to be satisfied. Like, I think that's a an ingrained part of the human condition. And I think she embodies all of that so well. And I just find her, like, I think Barbara Stanwyck is so good at sort of playing the two part halves of Phyllis in every single scene where she's sort of reacting in the moment to whatever she thinks the person that she's talking to wants to hear. But you can also see the calculation underneath, you know, and there will be little moments where someone's not looking at her and she'll kind of give a little glance glance or her mouth will sort of smirk or something in a particular way that you you can tell she's putting on a performance basically every moment that she's um existing and she's you know she's shaping herself in order to get the things that she wants and i just find that so well performed and so you know watchable basically because you you're just mo- wondering at every moment all right what's she going to do next and one of the things that i'm i had forgotten exactly how this shakes it sh- shakes out in the very end and um it sort of surprised me like i had forgotten it goes down exactly this way which is when they confront each other she ends up being the one who has this moment of softening so she shoots walter but then he comes toward her and she can't shoot again and she's like I can't do it. Just hold me. And then he's the one who shoots her, which is almost a reversal of what you would expect from their characters elsewhere. You know, you would expect him to be the one to have the moment of softening and her to be the one who's completely heartless. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? That that those those final moments, do you think she's genuine in that? Do you think there's it's like this last moment of humanity from her coming out when it's basically too late or do you think there's some other interpretation? I'm going I'm going back and forth in my head because part of me thinks that it's it's kind of her last attempt of I know how much you want me to love you because he says so many times in the movie I mean they both kind of do but they both kind of express how I want to get back to the way things were and he's very vocal about how infatuated he is with her And so part of me feels like this could be her recognizing like this is the this is the trump card like if i if i this is 
the only chance that I have of surviving this, if I tell him this, then, and if he decides not to take it, then, oh, well, I tried my best. So part of me thinks that it could be her last, you know, her, her, what's her last stand of like, okay, let's see if this works. But the other part of me feels like, well, she does seem to be kind of genuinely shocked of like, wait a minute. Now, now that I'm dying, I did not expect like, whoa, I'm actually in love with you because I'm dying anyway. So I know there's nothing for me to win here. And so I'm feeling real emotion for the first time because I'm recognizing it's over. And it's one of those things where it's like, it's a shock to you. It's a shock to me too, but here we are. <laughs> um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe that's the intention of the movie to have it be more ambiguous and nuanced. Um, but that's my takeaway. I don't, I don't see a clear answer there. I don't know if you see a clear answer, but yeah, no, I, I don't either. I mean, the cynical part of me wants to be like, probably the, the idea is the studio is like, we can't have the, the, oh, the yeah. <laughs> we have You're to have Walter wrong. alive at the end. And, you know, we can't have the female be the one to, to cold bloodedly murder someone. She has to get murdered. You're so. honestly probably right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> But yeah. it is interesting at the very, even if it was some sort of a studio note or just sort of like shaping the ending to the expectations of 1940s audiences. Because um, also, which I I read the book way, way back a million years ago, but I did not remember this. This is a very different ending from what is in the book. In the book, they, I don't remember the exact details, but the two of them end up dying by suicide. Um, but very Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. <laughs> I think they do get caught at some point though and and they anyway, I don't remember exactly. I'd have to reread it. But um but they basically created this ending for uh the movie. And apparently James M. Kane was like, this is a really good ending. I wish I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> um sometimes it happens. Yeah. But yeah, regardless of how it came about or or um you know, whose whose idea was it, it was. I think it does add at least a very an interesting level of intrigue and nuance to that very end. You know, you I mean, Walter Neff to his, you know, dying moments, which will be like 45 minutes later, will probably be wondering, was she genuine? Was she not genuine? I'm never going to know, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on a little bit of a different note, I wanted to ask because I was kind of confused this time around. I don't remember what my thoughts were the first time, but I was confused on the role of Nino in this movie. I, I don't fully understand because what I do understand is that Nino is dating Lola. Lola's super into him, but they have a very like, clearly toxic and abusive relationship. Yes, 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 yes. And her father recognizes that and is like, stop seeing him. And she's like, no, dad. But then we learn later on, after the two of them kind of break up or whatever, that Nino has been going to the house to see Phyllis on a somewhat regular basis. And then there's like a confrontation between him and Walter at the end where Walter tells Phyllis like, oh yeah, he's coming with the police. And then he comes without the police and then Walter confronts him about something that I don't understand and tells him to leave. I just didn't understand Nino because it felt like there was a huge thing there that kind of was um, like the, the the thing that started the domino effect of like, oh, this is how everything's unraveling or whatever. But I didn't understand it. Yeah. So my understanding of it, this may not be perfect, but this is this is the way I interpret it. When um, when Walter hears that Nino has been going to the house to see Phyllis, his immediate assumption is, oh, she's been she and Nino have been sleeping together this entire time. Right. So right. she's just used me to get rid of her husband so that she can then be with Nino. Mm -hmm. When he goes to confront Phyllis, though, what she tells him is that actually they haven't been sleeping together. She's been trying to work on Nino to basically tell him that Walter and Lola have been hanging out, work, hopefully work Nino up into a jealous rage because Nino is this extremely hot-headed, oh. violent boy. Then Nino will hopefully go kill Lola, who Phyllis okay. hates, also kill Walter, who, you know, is a problem for Phyllis because he knows what he, he was involved in the murder with her. And then, you know, Nino will get arrested and basically all everything that is a problem in Phyllis's life will be solved. 
Okay, gotcha. That that makes sense. Yeah. And then when Nino shows up at the very end, it's like he's just been, you know, he had a preordained appointment to meet Phyllis the same way. But Walter, in kind of a last act of mercy, which Nino does not deserve, but, you know, it's I assume it's probably more for Lola's sake than for Nino's, is just like, don't go in the house, you know, knowing that Phyllis is dead in there. If Nino goes in, there's a chance he might get blamed. And then he goes and tells him to see Lola instead. Okay. Yeah. Which, gotcha. by the way... Which is definitely a loose end. Like, yeah. that's definitely Walter acknowledging at that point that this is over. Mm -hmm. Because that's a witness that you're just letting go who could yeah. very well be like, yeah, so mm -hmm. he was there in the bushes yeah. the night that she died. <laughs> well, and there's a, like... There's a point, I can't remember exactly what it is, but there's a point at which Nino could very well, if Walter had arranged it differently, Nino could been a, have been a convenient scapegoat for him. He probably could have, at some point, I think the police or maybe Keys are suspicious of Nino. Walter probably could have arranged it so that Nino would get arrested. He doesn't seem to have an alibi mm. for that night. He could have been a, right. a way yeah, for yeah. Walter himself to get off, but um, it ends up that's not how it goes down and walter decides to you know push him and, and lola back together which by the way the the relationship between walter and lola is also really interesting because i think it's creepy yeah very, not, i don't like it very creepy i don't like it at all i think in the book from what i remember again it's been a really long time it is a bit more explicitly walter is in love with lola creepily in love with lola and you know wants to get rid of Phyllis so he can be with Lola. Here it seems to be a bit more um well it here it's more ambiguous, which I really like, where it's like he keeps telling himself, I just felt sorry for her. This is my guilt over my the part I played in her father's death talking. And so it's sort of this mishmash of I feel sorry for her. I want to make her feel better. Also she has invaluable information. I don't want her to talk and so I want to distract her. But also, you know, she's young and attractive, and maybe that's part of it, too. And we just, I think we don't really know to what extent any of those motivations are playing in his mind at any given moment, because he probably doesn't know it, too. He's just probably going off of instinct of, like, let me just hang out with this young, beautiful girl so that I can, because it fulfills multiple things for me I wouldn't say if that's instinct. I wouldn't say that's instinct, but well, whatever. Yeah. Uh, whatever you would call it. I think there's a big creep factor there, and I'm not here for it. But yeah. Oh, oh, he's just 100%. not a good person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> poor, poor Lola. You mean I, the you the know, murderer? <laughs> it's not a I good will. <laughs> I will say mm -hmm. I'm not. Th th you know, this is me um, mm -hmm. nitpicking, and this is just a personal taste thing. And I get it. This is you know 19. This movie was made in 1944. It's fine, but I really just don't like the archetype of like oh yeah the young girl who just falls in love with all these people left and right and she can't think clearly because she's in love and i'm like girl <laughs> what like stop <laughs> well the thing and that i really finally uh -huh. she does finally have her like come to jesus moment basically where she's like hey you know she, she does speak up and say i'm pretty sure this woman murdered my mother and like i'm i don't tell me that i'm crazy and that it's all in my head because i i like, I trust myself and I know what I saw, um, which is her standing up for herself in a way that I really like because Walter tried to be like, oh, it's all in your head. And she's like, nope, no, it's not. So I did really like that for her in that moment. But I just struggle in general with that archetype. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, women. I don't think she's just a pure, like, innocent, naive archetype. She is definitely part of that. But and this is something that I really like is like. The, you know, Phyllis is obviously the most villainous of all the Dietrichsons, but the other Dietrichsons are not perfect. I mean, Mr. Dietrichson has correct instincts about Nino, like he knows he's bad news, which is absolutely correct. But he's also really bullying to his wife and really, um, you know, overly sort of protective and invasive about his daughter in a way that seems she finds really stifling. And, you know, she lies to her father. She tells him she's going out roller skating mm -hmm. when she's actually going to see Nino. And it's you know, as much about rebellion as it is against her father as it is anything else. I mean, I think there is also a lot of like, sadly, women do get swept up in like, oh, there's this good looking guy who, you know, 
when he's nice to me, he's really nice to me. And oh, yeah, he has bad moments and um, he's had some bad luck. Couldn't have anything to do with the fact that he has a bad temper, but he's really a good guy. You know, like, sadly, that sort of abuse, you know, that sort that sort of mentality does happen. And that's where she seems to be at this particular moment. She's fallen prey to that kind of cycle in part because she's trying to get herself out from underneath her father and the stepmother who she hates and who is a murderer. And yeah, that's kind of where she's ended up. I mean, I certainly hope after the events of the story, (laughs) she is able to extricate herself and get to a better situation. But who knows? I mean, this is a film noir. Everyone is flawed and um, corruption is just pervasive. Except for Keys. Keys is the best (laughs) person in this movie. Yeah. Keys is the shining light. Yes. (laughs) So... I wanted to ask you about um, the score in this movie as well, because I kind of alluded to my feelings about it a little bit in the beginning, but it's just, maybe it's just because I haven't watched a movie from this time period in a while because it's been a hot minute, but it just, man, it's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot. Yeah. It's really funny that you say that because I'm just not great in general with noticing scores unless it's really like, okay. Unless there's something like really unique or very like catchy or something. Every time I think about this movie and I think about the score, I always put the score to Psycho on top of the scenes. Oh, I uh, don't yeah, know why. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are similarities. Um, but yeah, like you say the score and I can't picture it. I can only the picture the score from Psycho. And I just rewatched this movie last night. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> All right. Well, but I, I, I mean, you know, the score to Psycho is obviously perfect but it's also very sort of loud and overpowering and overbearing and so i can definitely see um where that complaint could come from i mean do you think like i do like the score in psycho for the record yeah i think it's great it's so good um but i mean from my memory of the score for this movie it is like all about creating that sort of claustrophobic effect that they're also going for with things like the cinematography you know the lighting the blocking things like that do you does it work for you at at least in some scenes on some level or do you just find it to be too much overall I mean, it's not across the board too much, but um, yeah, there were just specific moments that were were not infrequent while watching the movie that I was like, I don't know, because I feel like with the score, so I, I really connect with scores a lot when I watch movies, um, but at the same time, like I do notice them. Sometimes I'll watch movies and be like, oh, this sounds like that composer, because I do pay attention to them. Um, but at the same time, I do like the idea that the the score is just kind of a character that blends into the background and, and supports everything else that's going on in the movie and, and helps you like it helps move you from one place to another emotionally and thematically and things things like that which is great I love film scores but this one was just like be scared <laughs> be intimidated be confused and I was like okay I, I understand um but yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there's, you know, in the in the quote that you read in the beginning from the Criterion Collection, that that writer mentioned the score. So I'm sure there's lots of people that really like the score in this movie and appreciate it. It's probably iconic in certain ways. But for me, I was just like, there were some times when it was just kind of a, you know, a little a little help in the background that I appreciated. But there were other times that I was like. It, 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 okay, it reminds me of the um the the honest trailer for uh Christopher Nolan films and you know it's just like yeah. all of these loud oppressive Bomb. like organs just yeah. like you know he fell asleep with his head on the organ and just the volume kept going up 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 and it felt kind of like that to yeah, me a little yeah. bit but yeah um well I was doing the research for this movie I actually saw a couple little tidbits about the score which I don't I didn't end up putting it in the introduction, so I don't fully remember oh, them. But one of was like, Geneva, uh, can, "Sorry, can I just say real quick? Yeah, no shade to Hans Zimmer's scores in Christopher oh, sure. Nolan movies. Mm-hmm. I think they're all some of the best scores. Yes, I just want to put that out and the sorry. Ludwig Göransson scores. Yes, I agree. Yes, it, it's like a fun thing to make fun of, but it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, so it's yeah." Yeah, uh, works anyway, very sorry. well for the the movies that they're in. Um, <laughs> yes. But anyway, one of the things that I did see was like. Um, Because I think this score was kind of unusual for the time. It might actually have been like a first time film score or someone who like maybe is working music in another area. And this is his first time working in films or something like that. But apparently the music director at the whatever studio this was made by 
hated the score. Oh, no. <laughs> it was like <laughs> trying, going back and forth, like, no, this is awful. We need to change it. And then they didn't change it. And it like oh, got awards or got nominations. But I'm looking up uh, this person's, hold on. So this is Mik- Miklos oh, yeah. Rosa, uh, which Rosa. I'm assuming Rosa. is like some sort of Eastern. I think he's Hungarian. Um, yeah, Hungarian. So I'm trying American. to see where this falls. In Let's his... see. Oh um, no, he'd done lots of things before this. Oh, he had okay. Yeah, well, he'd done some quite early. A few. Okay. Oh, he'd done lots of things before this, like twenty things. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Well, never mind about that then. But regardless, the the tidbit that I saw again, I can't like verify this, but it's just that the music director really hated the score, That's and so Billy Wilder was like, "Nope, I like it." Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know, like as a director, stand up for your vision. Yeah. So did you did you want to talk about um, the cinematography at all? Mm. Yeah, I mean. I would love to. I don't feel like I have much to say about it because it's just like, it's so good. It's so iconic. It looks amazing. It's so influential on the way that we think about film noirs, just with like the use of the light, the shadows, the sort of, you know, the Venetian Venetian blinds creating these stripes across the characters as they move throughout the room. Apparently they like would throw dust into the air to try and create this sort of like slightly dusty, you know, stagnant Ooh, feeling, cool. which is very cool. Um, but yeah, like apart from that, I don't have a whole lot to say about it just apart from like, yeah. it's amazing. But if you have things to say about it, please. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure we brought it up. I mean, I, I agree with you that it's, it's very good, but I don't necessarily have like a in-depth breakdown of it, but I will say my favorite my favorite shot in the movie, which I'm sure you'll know exactly what it is when I bring it up, but it's that moment when Walter walks into the house for the last time to oh, confront yes. Phyllis and mm-hmm. she's sitting in her chair oh, and he opens yes. the door. Mm-hmm. And I just, I loved, I loved that shot. Kind of like you were saying how it plays with lighting and shadows and it just, I'm sure I could analyze it more if I was watching it right now in terms of like, oh, the the power of the lighting and this and he's moving closer and she's sitting down and then she stands up and he sits in the window. Like there's probably ways that I could break that down, but I don't know it by heart at this point. But that shot, I just saw it and I was like, oh, oh, that's a shot. That's good. good." And Um, also like, and I've ranted about this before and this is, you know, take this with a grain of whatever salt because this is someone who knows nothing about lighting in movies apart from like I see something I like it I see something I don't like it but (laughs) I feel like we've really lost the art of lighting because just that shot of her sitting in the chair and it's like everything around her is black and her face can't be seen but there's just a little light going across her white outfit and you can just see so clearly how she's sitting, where she is in the room. Like you have all the information you need, but there's so little that's being shown, but it's just so expertly lit and blocked that you're just like, you're not confused. You know, it's everything is there for a reason. Whereas so many like dark, poorly lit, like movies and TV today, it's just like I think you're just watching too much Netflix. Uh, I don't think the art of it's definitely is Netflix. Dead. I mean, many people, myself included, have complained about the that final season of Game of Thrones and how so much of it's just like dark shapes moving and you can't actually see who it is. Like if it's dark, it's dark, but throw a light on your a key light on your actor's face, like for God's sake. Um. Anyway, sorry, that's my little. I don't think the piece. art of lighting is dead. I think it just depends on it what does you're depend on the media yeah and I black mean, and white photography is very different as yeah well. it's true so. and netflix is notoriously terrible for um like the standards that they set and the the sort of like how quickly and um you have so you don't have as much time to do complicated setups that would really make it go look better and stuff like that also and this is such a tiny thing and i do not have the technical knowledge to discuss why this is so maybe it's just in my head but as someone who watches a lot of 1930s and 40s black and white films it is always so apparent when a black and white film has been made in the 30s and 40s when they were doing it all the time and they knew exactly how to light what textures to use in the costumes how to block things how to product you know design the the sets and things versus modern day movies that use black and white 
Like there is there are many that do it well nowadays, but it's just always there's always something so different, even when they're trying to evoke the look of an older film. It just always looks so modern. And I can't put my finger on why. <laughs> and I was just thinking about this because I've been watching um, in little chunks <laughs> Maestro on Netflix, where the first third or so of it is all black Geneva, and white. That's Netflix. That's Netflix. Well, I, it is Netflix. Too much Netflix. <laughs> but it's not like a Netflix original. It's like a director who's like trying to put thought into these things but i mean it's the same same goes for like i don't know mank or belfast or even oppenheimer like the black and white looks so modern to me in a certain way and i don't know why it is and it doesn't always necessarily look bad modern it just it doesn't look the same and i don't know why that is i would love someone more knowledgeable to explain to me but i think that you are biased because of the movies that you like and the time period that yeah. you are accustomed to. That's very possible. It's it's a different style. Mm-hmm. And just because a style is different doesn't necessarily mean that it's worse. Yeah. Which is not me vouching for 95% <laughs> of the cinematography that we see on Netflix. Uh-huh. But, you know, we were we were just talking about Carol a few weeks back. The lighting mm. in that movie is fantastic. It is, yeah. Or if someone wants to see a movie with great lighting, go see Poor Things. Like, Poor Things is top tier or anyway. i complimented the lighting in the color purple in our last episode mm-hmm. i thought that was really really yeah. well done so there's a lot of really good lighting out there i think it just depends on what you're watching yeah. and also it's what true. your predisposed preferences are it's true and i think for you because of what you like that affects your taste and what you appreciate versus what you don't appreciate mm-hmm. and i think that's a valid opinion to have but <laughs> I don't yeah, think that enough, the art of lighting enough. is dead. There's a lot of great lighting that's out there. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, can I just when I think about great black and white films from the last, you know, 5 to 10 years that really do make me feel like I've I've gone back in time. The, the Lighthouse? Well, that oh gosh, that's you, a great one too. I was going to say don't like the, me cooking. <laughs> I was going to say the Joel Cohen Macbeth. Oh, oh, incredible. So the very, yeah. I mean, it's very consciously sort of, you know, using the sort of German expressionism, chiascura, like very huge, big contrasts between darks and lights and, um, you know, large expressive shapes and things like that. It's just, oh, Both A24 gorgeous. movies. There's yeah. just. A24 is just it, fighting the good fight. I'm not going to go into this right now about <laughs> big studios versus independent. Also. Whatever. Not going to do it. Um. The only version of Nightmare Alley, the Guillermo del Toro version mm-hmm. of Nightmare Alley that I've seen is the black and white version that oh, was put that. in theaters. And it's gorgeous, honestly. Yeah. I don't think I would yeah. have liked that movie as much as I did if I had seen it, <laughs> seen well, the color version. I, when I saw it in color, I was like, I'm I'm pretty sure that this movie would be more enjoyable to watch in black and white. Mm-hmm. But I didn't like this movie enough yeah. to watch. <laughs> um, so you're probably right. Yeah. If I had not... If they had released the color and the black and white at the same time, mm-hmm. I would have seen the black and white instead. Yeah. But it's too late now. I will never yep. watch that movie again. Not because it's a bad movie, but because it was horrifying to me and yep. I almost threw up. Anyway, this has been a huge tangent. Yeah. <laughs> Should we come back to this movie? Yeah, let's come back to this movie. <laughs> are there are there any specific plot points or moments that you want to specifically discuss great question because we've been talking for a while and i i don't know that we need to necessarily go through um every element of the plot but let me kind of like scroll through some of my notes um can i just say that walter says that he's 35 and i'm like dude <laughs> that's not there's to me no too. way you're 35 i you're actually like, i at least 40 <laughs> i'm gonna look this up right now because i was like i actually feel like i would believe it but in the but way of 35 like, in the way of like 35 in 1944 is not the same as 35 tonight but let me look it up now 19... No, he was born in 1908 44 minus... oh wait no he was 35 19... or like 30 oh he was 36. He was 36. <laughs> okay. Well. All right. I'm sorry. Now we know. Sorry, Fred McMurray. <laughs> My apologies to Fred McMurray. <laughs> like I said, at, at 35 in 1944 is not the same as the 35 now. I think it's just like the clothing, you know. It's people the clothing. that would be dressed like Yeah. I mean, 35. people weren't using sunscreen and moisturizer as much. People smoked what? a lot more. Like, Yeah. <laughs> 
never thought about it like that at all. People weren't wearing sunscreen. <laughs> it's true. The sun ages you. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's the best thing ever. But yeah, he does uh, not look 35 to me, but that's fine. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That, that line stuck out to me too, but yeah. Yeah. Actually now, how old is Barbara Stanwyck? Barbara Stanwyck is a year older than him. Dang, she looks like she's 19. She's born in 1907. Yeah, she does look very young. By the way, can we talk about that wig? Okay. <laughs> I'm looking at, sorry, I'm looking at the IMDb page, uh-huh. and there's just a picture of um him, like, standing by the door when she's hiding behind the door. After oh, my gosh. I love apartment. that scene. And it's her standing behind the door, and then him standing in front of the door. His... His, the waistline of his pants and his tie <laughs> in this specific thumbnail, I'm just like, it's insane. that is crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously at the time it was normal. Yeah. It's like not yeah. a big deal. But it's looking just, at it now, I'm like, that is so mm-hmm. wild. They are so high. The ties are so small. I mean. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Jeez. Her fashion in this movie, though, I did not realize until I was doing research that Edith had, you know absolute legend of costume design um designed for this movie but her her outfits are so good like the when she first appears in that towel and then she goes upstairs and comes down wearing this dress with these like these big huge frills in the front and it's like she's consciously trying to put herself back into this sort of you know sweet innocent housewife role but it's just completely fake looking and unconvincing it's so good it's almost like she's had these clothes in her closet like it's it's almost like she's had these clothes in her closet labeled for like when man shows (laughs) up that i'm going to seduce Uh (laughs) when person shows up thing i'll wear to funeral like she just has them labeled in her closet for the exact moment Mm -hmm. that anything could happen (laughs) it made me laugh so much well not laugh is not the right word but i the scene where he comes over for the second time or she invites him over it's like an after thursday afternoon and she's like oh yeah my husband i thought he was gonna be here but oh turns out he's not oh how could i have guessed and she's wearing this like much more sophisticated long like you know beautiful dress and that moment where she's like Nettie Nettie and then she kind of like gives this little glance and then she's like oh I forgot it's the maid's day off and he's like "Uh uh-huh sure yeah well that's another reason why in the beginning what I was saying you know Mm -hmm. that I don't like this man he's a sleazy gross person Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons why he doesn't why I don't hate him is because she clearly is like, like they're both 100% aware of the dynamic. They're mm-hmm. both aware of what's oh, going yeah. on. She is not being like, no one is being seduced into anything. Will. Mm-hmm. This is all, this is all consensual. What is happening mm-hmm. here in certain ways. Yeah. But yes, I, I love that dynamic between the two of them from the very beginning of like, Oh, you're giving me this vibe. I'm giving it right back. Mm-hmm. Ooh, you know? Yeah. And that's what it's... makes the sexual tension so good is we're like, these are two toxic people, but, you know, yep. they both know what they want yep. and what they want is each other. There's somebody for everybody, supposedly. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. I'm like, why, why can psychopath murderers find somebody? <laughs> but, like, <laughs> my friends can't. <laughs> this is weird. Well, do you want to end up bleeding out on the floor? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe hold out for something better then. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Sorry, I'm just though. like scrolling through the yeah. gallery of photos on IMDb because her costume so is so good. <laughs> that like yeah. when she comes over to his house and she's wearing the sweater that's like, you know, ostensibly it's very high necked. She's completely covered up, but it is so thin and see through. And like, yeah, it's just, it's so it's so perfect i I vividly remember in college a good friend of mine um he watched this movie for the first time in a class and then when he came out afterwards he was like yeah so we were watching this movie in this class and then at that moment you know when they they're on the the couch and then it cuts and they're sitting in a different position and she's fixing her lipstick my teacher went they just had sex and it was like this light bulb moment in my friend's mind where he's like whoa i did not realize that's what is implied there but yep that's exactly what just happened. 
I wanted to just note, speaking of specific moments in the movie, mm-hmm. that scene where um, where uh, Walter tells Phyllis, like, hey, yeah, it's safe to come over now. And then Key shows oh, up gosh. and they have this whole mm-hmm. conversation. But then it's like, oh. And every sh- moment you see in Walter's eyes, like, when mm-hmm. is she going to get here? When is she going to get here? What am I going to do? What am I going to say? And that tension. moment where she's behind the door. Oh. Yeah. The tension of that scene is so, so, so good. Mm-hmm. Like, just... The timing of it, the pacing of it, the writing of yeah, it. Yeah, it's Hitchcockian, just, you know? It's like, mm-hmm. it's just expert, like, lay the bomb under the table and, you know, watch the characters wait, wait for see. it to go off. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Similar thing with um, the moment when they have put Mr. Dietrichson's corpse on the train tracks. And they're going to drive away and the car won't start, which apparently oh, was... I forgot about that. Yeah, which apparently yeah. was not in the original script. It was... Um, it was like an on the day, like Billy Wilder just had this idea and was like, oh, let's do this. And so they did it. And it works so well. It's this incredible moment of, you know, they think they've just done everything perfectly. And now this one thing seems like it's going to screw up. And the looks on both of their faces as they're mm. just like, like, I love how he's unwrapping like, his leg and he doesn't even notice slowly. at first. Yeah. <laughs> it's like he doesn't even notice at first. And then he sort of slowly looks over and is like, oh, no. <laughs> yep. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to talk at all about that um, mm-hmm. that final interaction between Walter and Keyes? Was there anything else there that you wanted to address, like with him on the floor or anything like that? Um, that's a great question, because I know we, we talked about it a fair amount at the beginning. Let me see if there's anything else in my notes that we didn't really mention. I mean, the brilliance of the framing device in general, which I don't think was part of the book. I think that was a de- adaptation decision of having the entire story be told through flashbacks through that, you know, classic film noir voiceover. But it's Walter telling this whole story to Keys. Keys, who we find out throughout the stories, is like his one friend and this person who's like, you know, I know that you you didn't figure this out. So I'm sort of gloating about you're not figuring it out but also i know that you would want to know and like i don't know there's like this sort of complicated dynamic there and then like i don't know just the heartbreak of keys comes in and is just kind of standing there silently until walter realizes that he's there and then um like keys is going to call a doctor you know he's like you're bleeding we need to get you some help and Walter's like, no, 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 no. I don't want them to patch me up only for them to then kill me, which, you know, at this time, murderers go to the electric chair. There isn't, you know, going to jail for life is not as much a a thing then as as it is now. And um, like, I don't know, just just that heartbreak of him like trying to make a run for it. And it's just like, it's completely impossible. You know, he spent so much time telling Keys the story over the recorder that he's bled out and, you know, death is probably just minutes away. Yeah, I don't know. And uh, <laughs> I, I just love that final scene of, of the two of them together, how just quiet and gentle Keys is and understanding, you know, of like, this is a horrible thing that you did, but I'm not going to condemn you for it. I'm just going to kind of be here and listen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, we have the recurring callback to the thing. He Keys keeps trying to light a cigar and he can't. And so Walter will light it for him. And it's kind of his way of saying, I love you. Like he will explicitly say, I love you, which is very cute. And then at the end, Keys lights the, the cigarette for him. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, do you have any other thoughts about that scene or other scenes throughout the film? I'm trying to think of there are just so many good scenes in this movie. We haven't talked about I'm, yet. I'm feeling pretty good. Okay. I do love <laughs> the two grocery store scenes where they meet and mm-hmm. they're like, they're trying to be discreet, but they are so obvious. No. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Especially the second one where Phyllis is wearing these giant sunglasses indoors and she looks amazing, but it's like, you guys are clearly up to something. Yep. Up to no good. <laughs> Up to no good. Um, let's see. I feel like, too, I mean, this is just my little, you know, history nerdery, but just the whole dynamic of, like, you know, I'm an insurance salesman. There are all these different types of insurance I can buy. And, like, we're, we're listing off actuarial tables and statistics on, on 
you know, ways people can die and stuff. Like how much of this movie is we live in an insane modern age where, you know, everything is commercial and um, we've quantified the ways that people can die and we can use those to try and track down crime and, um, you know, the the and I, this is such a theme in like the apartment this idea of we live in this age that is so commercial and so money hungry and we live at the the mercy of these powerful corporations and um in you know companies who own our souls and things like that i mean these are very modern concepts they're the 1930s 1940s version of it but you know this is one of the things that really endures about this movie is that it's in operating within these dynamics that are so familiar. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Like the scene where Walter comes in just at the very beginning and he looks over the, um, the office that's empty and the janitors are cleaning up and it kind of calls, I mean, this is the forerunner to that scene in the apartment where you just look out on the sea of desks and they're all exactly the same mm. and they just stretch out into nowhere. And it's this, mm -hmm. you know, it's so lonely. It, it's so compact. Like everyone, it's so many people and yet it's so lonely at the same time. It's, yeah, it's so good. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's about it. <laughs> so okay. many more things that we could talk about, but I think we need to wrap this up. All right. Um, so in terms of this movie's awards, um, this movie was nominated for seven Oscars. It did not win any, which is very unfortunate. This was the year that, um, for, from what I read, I think it's kind of the case where we're coming to the end of World War II. This movie, I mean, they consciously said it a few years prior, back in the, the late 30s. Um, this movie's a period piece <laughs> because they didn't want to deal with the idea of the war. But I think it was kind of the case of like people were really tired. They just wanted something a bit more uplifting or something that would disconnect them a little bit more. And so it may be the thing that swept a lot of the awards was this film called Going My Way with Bing Crosby, which I've not seen. But my understanding is it's more like a I don't know if it's a comedy, but kind of a musical fantastical or like uplifting type story uh more so than this um this is also movie would be more uplifting. yeah <laughs> <laughs> although this was also the year of gaslight and um ingrid bergman won best actress for gaslight over barbara stanwyck um so i don't know but anyway yeah so it was nominated for seven oscars those oscars were best picture best director best actress for barbara stanwyck best screenplay best black and white cinematography best sound and best score um, I wish it had won something, but obviously it is a classic the that is endured. It's so. very strong. Mm hmm Yeah, yeah. I'm I don't remember what won out over that for this year, but um yeah. Uh anyway, obviously this movie has endured, so you know, it's fine. But uh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> All right. In terms of critical response, so this movie was uh critically well reviewed at the time. Um, now, of course, it's, you know, <laughs> absolute enduring classic. Metacritic has it at 95. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 97%. I should have looked up the little 3% reviews who don't I like know. Donald and Damnity, but... This movie, flop. Yeah. Not good. Not good. Um, okay. So I pulled a couple of quit critics quotes here. I don't want to read all of them because we don't have too much time but okay so first this is paul howlett writing in the guardian he says what marks double indemnity out from other great film noirs is that sense among all the crazy twisted duplicitous shenanigans of real human heartbreak it isn't in the violent showdown that concludes the neff phyllis passion play that was a fatal clinch from the start despite their fluctuating emotions no it's when the dying neff spells it out to keys you couldn't figure this one out because the guy you were looking for was too cro close right across the desk from you. Keys quietly, tenderly replies, closer than that, Walter. Mm. Um, and then I pulled another quote from Angelica Jade Bastian's uh, essay for Criterion. The essay is called The Black Heart of Double Indemnity. It's a really interesting essay. I highly recommend it. She's a really good writer. Um, but actually, I pulled two, and now I'm like, which one do I read? Because <laughs> I don't want to read them both. read them both. Um, I will read the first one. 
So she writes, there's a reason double indemnity has endured for nearly 80 years. It is, an achingly, it is achingly complex in its relationship to the thematic fuel that powers noir. Alienation, masculinity, desire, and the dreams and fears of white America. The depiction of Phyllis is especially shrewd, challenging ideas about femininity, once again the charge of misogyny against Wilder, with its understanding of what might push a woman toward violence in order to experience the freedom men take for granted. Stanwyck's marriage of the technical and the emotional crafts a femme fatale against whom all others are measured. She's intelligent, conniving, and driven fiercely by her own unique desires. That's a huge focus on Phyllis there. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. A lot of her, um, the first part of her essay is about specifically Phyllis and, and Stanwyck's performance. Um, and she goes on a bit to talk about sort of the, the racial dynamics in, at play in the film. You know, they're not explicit, but there is that sort of undercurrent there. Um, yeah, it's really Racial? fascinating. Everyone's white. The sort of like, this is a, you know, a white America where I, I can't really describe it. She, she explains it much better. Um, okay. You know, she kind of talks about how there are people of color that we see always in sort of in the margins there, you know, multiple people that um, Walter is kind of using to establish his alibi and in other roles uh, throughout the film and kind of this idea of the like the white majority culture in America that's very masculine that's very sort of you know um, you know straight all American and this film is showing that 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 twisted underbelly to all of it um, mm, okay yeah I recommend seeking it out if, if that sounds interesting all right, so final thoughts. Um, gosh, I don't even know what to say. This movie is so good. There's just, there's so much to unpack. Um, you know, there's a reason that it has endured for so long. The performances are excellent. The, uh, the script is excellent. The direction is excellent. And it somehow creates these incredibly twisted horrible characters and yet makes them compelling and makes them fascinating to watch and you do feel genuinely moved at the end by the tragedy of what unfolds and i think that's just excellent filmmaking you know excellent art so yeah what about you final thoughts yeah i mean i think what's just going to stick with me is is the writing there's so many great little one-off lines in this movie that um that I just think are really captivating and whether they're funny or a little bit scary or whatever it might be, there's just so many great lines in this movie. So I think that's kind of the main thing that I'm going to take away. But I mean, I also love keys. Keys is great. Keys so is great. It, yeah. <laughs> it's a great movie. It really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, do you want to tell the people what we're going to be talking about next week? Yes. Next week we are going to be watching a movie that I love. It is, called Thelma and Louise from 1991 directed by Ridley Scott back when Wait, are you was, serious? Yeah. How did back I Back when he was making movies that people actually oh wanted gosh. to see. Um, I'm sure I knew this at one point. It's but it's one of those facts that you kind of forget and then it's like, wait, what? Yep. Uh Geneva, I really want you to not look up the cast to this movie because I did not do that before I watched this the first time and there is a shock a shockingly oh just like a person who shows up and it's like wait i unfortunately what? think i might know who you're talking oh, about but okay. i won't look up okay. any further in case i'm wrong oh you probably know who it is um but yes it's a great movie i love it it's a uh, female empowerment uh it's still very strange to me that it's i mean it's not strange that it's directed by ridley scott i mean he made alien but it's um, strange for him to be making a movie that's set like in the contemporary time and yeah know, not starring russell crowe opening an orchard or whatever he does <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yes i'm very excited to watch it again and to talk about it so yeah all next right. week I'm excited Thelma and louise great all right well thanks everybody for listening have a good one see you next time bye Thanks for listening. If you want to get in touch with us, you could email us at yourpickpod at gmail.com. Our theme song was composed by Joel Rushton, and our podcast graphic was designed by Kara Shin. If you like this show and want to hear more, please rate and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're excited to have you on this journey with us. Until next time.